Coming up on Jerusalem Dateline, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu digs in his heels on the Gaza offensive, while U.S. President Biden pushes back, threatening to withhold weapons support. Plus, CBN President Gordon Robertson shares his impressions after his trip through Israel. And it's that time of year, running through 3,000 years of history in Jerusalem's annual marathon. All this and more coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to the special edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. We're coming to you from the sidelines of the 13th annual Jerusalem Marathon. We'll have more from that later in our show, but here's the latest update. In his State of the Union address, President Biden put the burden on Israel to protect Gazans. Israel has a added burden because Hamas hides and operates among the civilian population like cowards under hospitals, daycare centers, and all the like. Israel also has a fundamental responsibility, though, to protect innocent civilians in Gaza. In order to increase humanitarian aid into Gaza, the administration announced plans to build a pier in Gaza. Senator Marco Rubio pushed back on that idea on Fox News. The only people on the ground with any organization to distribute things are Hamas. So in essence, can they guarantee that we're going to go through all this trouble, put American lives on the line, just so aid can be distributed to Hamas, who in turn will then control it like they've controlled everything. There's no Hamas fighters starving to death, and Hamas has no history, none whatsoever. They have zero history of other helping civilians or people. So this is all for show, and it's dangerous. Rubio says the fastest way to get aid to Gaza is to defeat Hamas. It's a goal Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu pledged to IDF soldiers at a graduation ceremony saying Israel had to take out the last Hamas stronghold in Rafah. Whoever tells us not to operate in Rafah is telling us to lose the war, and that will not happen. There is international pressure, and it is increasing. But it is precisely when the international pressure increases that we must close ranks among ourselves. We must stand together against the attempts to stop the war. This is what the psalmist says, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. But today, we have a clear goal, achieving total victory in the war. In what would be a major move, the Biden administration appears to be considering restricting the use of U.S. munitions if Israel launches a military operation into Rafah. David Ignatius of the Washington Post quoted former U.S. ambassador to Israel, Martin Indek. If Israel launches an offensive in Rafah without adequately protecting the displaced civilian population, it may precipitate an unprecedented crisis in U.S.-Israel relations, even involving armed supplies. Colonel Richard Kemp, former commander of British forces in Afghanistan, tells CBN News that would play into the hands of Hamas. I think it's uh, very irresponsible of the United States because um, President Biden himself and Secretary Blinken have both said that they understand Israel's need to eliminate Hamas. And to do that, they've got to go into Rafah. If they don't destroy Hamas in Rafah, then effectively Hamas have survived and will have won the war. They will declare victory. They, there will still be a major threat to Israel. Meanwhile, the head of Hamas, Ya'ir Sinwar, is reportedly holding up the negotiations for a ceasefire and the release of the remaining hostages. The Wall Street Journal reports Sinwar believes Hamas has the upper hand in the talks because of the splits in the Israeli war government and divisions between the U.S. and Israel. So he's demanding a permanent ceasefire and a pullout of all Israeli forces from Gaza, conditions Israel won't accept. The world appears to be counting on the tiny country of Qatar to help negotiate a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas that could lead to the release of the hostages. But some question whether the country's ruling family is a reliable partner in the process. In 2022, the Biden administration designated Qatar as a major non-NATO ally. That designation carries military and economic privileges as well as what the State Department calls a powerful symbol of the close relationship with the United States. Qatar also hosts CENTCOM, the largest U.S. base in the Middle East. 
Qatar is an Islamist sponsor of terrorism. Uh, they belong uh, not to the Western bloc, not to the American bloc, but to the opposite, to the Russian-Chinese bloc, to Iran. Yigal Karman, the founder of Memory, the Middle East Media Research Institute, strongly disagrees with the U.S. views of Qatar, calling it a longtime sponsor of Hamas. Qatar gave them billions of dollars over the years. They became a tiny empire, military empire. All the uh, missiles to Tel Aviv, all the almost 40,000 weapon holders, killers, all the drones, all the motorcycles, what have you, all their equipment, everything, every single missile is, Hama, is uh, Qatar. So Qatar is Hamas, Hamas is Qatar. They go together. Israeli attorney Netsana Darshan Leitner tells CBN News the country uses its charities to funnel money to the terror group. The Qatari Foundation, which is a huge charity in Qatar, gives hundreds of millions of dollars to the um, charity organizations of Hamas in Gaza. But the charity organizations of Hamas in Gaza are Hamas. They give foods for the people in order to be loyal to Hamas. They share the same facilities with Hamas. They pay the salaries of the militants of Hamas. Qatar's ruling Al-Fani family also hosts the top leaders of Hamas, like Ismail Haniya. Kaman also accuses Qatar of being a sworn enemy of regional U.S. allies, like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Egypt. Lately, other voices like Rabbis United, and Rabbi Penny Dunner demonstrated outside Qatar's Los Angeles consulate to publicly pressure the country's rulers. We want that to end, and Qatar has the power to do it. They are ostensibly an ally of America. Is this the way allies behave? I don't no. think so. No. And if that's the case, they should change their ways and make a difference, they can do it. Carmon questions why the administration doesn't recognize the issue and force Qatar's hand. What we see is on the American side begging. Even after 32 Americans were killed in October 7 and 8 are still hostages, Qatar did nothing to rescue even the American ones, only. Qatar is betraying America all the time, and from the American side, there's not one ounce of pressure. It's one reason why Carmon speculates there remains no deal. Why the deal is not happening? Because Qatar did not pressure uh, Hamas. And they could pressure them because for Hamas, Qatar is the lifeline. Qatar is the hope, the future, the power to continue to fight and to hold the hostages. If Qatar had pressured Hamas, there might have been good chances that there might have been a, an agreement. In January, the Biden administration renewed the CENTCOM military lease for another 10 years. Carmon says the U.S. could have used relocating the base as leverage. It's so easy. Just see if you can relocate. Qatar will become a uh, the best ally for America, in truth. Mm. But now it's a Trojan horse. Why should they do anything? America is happy with them anyway. Being anti-American. This is an enigma. Why embrace a power that is Islamist, that is supporter of terrorism, that, is, that belongs to the bloc of Iran, Russia, China? While Carmon and others wait for the U.S. to potentially remove Qatar from its position of influence, the country will likely straddle the geopolitical fence between being a U.S. ally and also standing with the enemies of America. Coming up, an interview with CBN President and CEO Gordon Robertson. Israel has a great friend in the Robertson family. Gordon Robertson stopped by our studio the other day after a week of filming around the country. Here's part one of our interview. This is your first visit here to Israel since October 7th. Tell us your impressions. 
the strongest impression was when from Kavar Aza, um, and that is one of the kibbutzes that was hit so hard by Hamas on October 7th. Uh, for people who don't know what Kafar Aza means, it literally means town of Gaza. It's right next to the border. And the people who made that kibbutz wanted to honor Gaza in their name. They were actually friends with Gaza. They were for peace. They were for blessing people in, in Gaza. And then the terrorists came through on October 7th and murdered them and occupied for four days, it took four days for the IDF to finally clear it of all the terrorists. Until you see it, you can see it on video, but until you see it in person and you talk to the people that were so impacted by the attack, who lost their loved ones in that horror, you don't quite get it. But when you're there in person and you can see it, you can see the destruction, you can see the places where people died. Uh, where there are still stains on the wall, there's still bullet holes. It just, I don't have words for it. Since October 7th, you've been forthright, steadfast in your support for Israel. Is the experience at Kafar Aza, and is that going to make your sense even stronger to stand with Israel? Well, I said it two days after the attack, the first program we had, we have seen the face of evil. What happened on October 7th, was evil unmasked, and you have to call it for what it is. Uh, this isn't some kind of protest. This, this is pure evil with the intent to murder and maim and humiliate the Jewish people just because they're Jewish. Let us call that out for what it is, and let us call for Hamas to cease to exist. Their leadership shouldn't lead anything anymore. Any country that has sent them money, any country that is providing them aid and comfort, they should all be boycotted. They shouldn't be allowed to participate fully with the other nations of the planet. Hamas needs to unconditionally surrender, release all of the hostages, lay down their arms, uh, and allow Israel to establish security in that area. Uh, these are the conditions for a ceasefire, and these are the things that Israel absolutely has to do for its future. And this is a time when the nations of the world are coming against Israel, when there's demonstrations globally from the river to the sea. They want to exterminate Israel. I think many people who are saying from the river of, to the sea, Palestine will be free. For whatever reason, that's gotten popular on college campuses, not just in America, not just in Europe, but literally around the world. Why do they do that? They, they need to know what that means in the history of that phrase. That phrase means genocide. That means for Palestine to be free, every single Jew in Israel needs to be killed. Uh, part of that call let us drive them into the sea, and they fully intend to drown them there. Mm -hmm. And if they won't go into the sea and drown, they'll kill them on the shore. We need to proclaim that to say, no, that not on our watch. You don't get to proclaim genocide for an entire people. Um, Israel exists for a reason. And one of the main reasons under international law is the Jewish people have a right to self-determination. They have a right to have that in the land of their ancestors. In this land, they have that right under international law that has been recognized by the UN. Anyone who's chanting that is saying, Israel doesn't have a right to exist. So let's tell that story. Let's tell the history, the right history of how Israel came to be how Israel has survived so many wars, so many terror attacks, so many attempts to wipe it off the, off the map. Let's tell that story so the world knows exactly what that phrase means. Are these the messages you'll be taking back to American Christians and the Jewish community? Uh, these are the messages I've been, I've been saying since October 9, and I will continue to say them with renewed
vigor based on what I saw. Mm. And I know the cost. I was up in Capernaum in, in Galilee, and I heard the jets going over overhead into southern Lebanon. I, I know the cost and the potential for there be to be yet another front in this war that if uh, Hezbollah gets involved and there's not just trading missiles and rockets across the border and airstrikes across the border. If it turns into a, a real war, um, the cost for Israel will be enormous. Uh, but the cost for Israel is already enormous. And the cost that was paid on October 7th, already enormous. For Israel to have a future and a secure future for every person living in Israel, they have to complete this. Hamas has to be eliminated. Mm. Up next, revelations about the truth of violence toward women by Hamas on October 7th. Vindication finally for the victims. The Jerusalem Marathon is marking International Women's Day and raising awareness of those still held captive in Gaza. The world has been largely silent about the sexual attacks Hamas carried out against women and others on October 7th, and the hostages are still enduring. Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl interviewed Orit Soliziano, executive director of the Association of Rape Crisis Centers in Israel, which recently published a report detailing the horrors that women suffered at the hands of Hamas terrorists that day. What we did is actually one thing. We tried to see where did the things happen and what happened. So what we found out is, first of all, that there were four scenes to the sexual violence. It was the Nova party area. It was the kibbutzim and all these small villages around there. It was at the army bases. And also it was the hostages that are in captivity. And then what we did was to see what happened. I don't want to go into graphic details because it's really something oh, you, uh, uh, a regular human being. It's very hard to judge to digest the atrocities. But what we saw, that in all of the places, the similar things happened, like shooting in the genitals, disfiguring the bodies, especially in the genitals. It happened in all places, burning of bodies in all places, gang raping. What we saw, first of all, it was systematic, not one place, all of the places. Not one uh, uh, mutilation, many mutilation. And when you, you see the big picture from the macro level, you understand two things. First of all, you understand that somebody gave the Hamas terrorists a directive to do it. Otherwise, it would be sporadic, maybe one place here, one place there. But no, it was systematic, planned, intentional, sexual violence atrocities, wow. very sadistic and very brutal. As being an Israeli and also even being, my mother was a survivor of the Holocaust, and being a daughter of a survivor, you know, it's very hard to see that these kind of things happen and, and the world denies, don't, doesn't care, doesn't believe. You know, you can really support a woman that are suffering also in Gaza. But it's impossible and unbelievable that you don't talk about what's happening to us and what still is happening to our hostages every day in the horrific uh, situation in captivity. So what do you want to see the UN to do? How do you want to see the world in general respond to this? No matter politics, no politics here. There is no excuse to what was done. There was no excuse in the sadistic, systematic terror attack. And, and, and the first thing is to acknowledge that. That's enough, you know. And the UN bodies, it's more than that. They should issue reports. They should get a, a good information. They should work and invest a lot of time. And I want to, the world, you know, to acknowledge that because what happened in Israel could happen in the United, United States. A terror attack of Hamas jihadists could happen in Times Square. You know, we had not, like you had 9-11, the world had 9-11. You know, history repeats itself. So if you don't stand up and shout and, and acknowledge, you let these horrific, horrible people continue. Up next, young and old, male and female, soldier and civilian, there's a place for everyone in Jerusalem's annual marathon.
Jerusalem is festive today as the 13th annual marathon brings tens of thousands of runners to the city, as you can see. They're from within the country and around the world. And despite the war in the south and on the northern border, Jerusalem went ahead with the marathon as a tribute to the IDF, security forces and rescue teams working around the clock. The marathon kicked off this morning near the Knesset and winds past significant landmarks throughout the city. It's a run past 3,000 years of history, and especially this year, Jerusalem's marathon is a demonstration of the resilience of the Israeli spirit. Well, that's all for this special edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on social media and access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And please continue to pray for Israel, IDF soldiers, and for the release of all the hostages. And please join us in prayer at this time that all threats and plans for evil against people living in Jerusalem and across Israel will be thwarted that no weapon or plan formed against God's people will prosper. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.